Jesus, the one who makes us sing Jesus, sets the way. He is the one who rose victorious, shed it all with us. He is the one that died to save. Jesus, the one who was cast out to bring us back in. Jesus is indeed the true and better King. Good morning, St. Mark's, and a very, very warm welcome to you all. My name is uh, Saju Matlali, and I'm the uh, vicar at St. Mark's and the St. Mary's Island. I especially like to extend a warm welcome to anyone who is new or who has not been a regular member of a church in the past. I hope you feel fully part of this online worshipping community today and that you find you have the opportunity to do to meet with God through this worship service. We're going to start with confession. Confession is simply saying sorry. When we say sorry to Jesus, we are told he is faithful, that he is just, he is good to forgive us of all the wrong things. Who needs forgiveness and cleansing this morning? I do. So let's use the words on the screen to say sorry to Jesus. Together saying, most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May the Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, may he have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As forgiven people, let's sing, sing for joy. Good morning. Thanks for joining us for today's service. Remember what the Bible says, that if my people who are called by my name will seek my face and humble themselves, I will heal their land. I will forgive them. Come with me as we sing for joy to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. <laughs> Oh, you say, stop, God. 
praised. It is the grace of God that makes us sing for joy, that makes us sing with joy even in the midst of everything. We bless the name of the Lord for the grace he has given unto us. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless is all in him. Let me be 
Good to worship together. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Catherine, for facilitating and enabling us to um, to worship um, this morning. I can look at the comment section, and I see that some of you are dancing in your living room. Some of you are singing together, which is brilliant. Hey, can I be really honest with you this morning and say one of my fears of um, doing online church? One of my fears in doing online church is that we end up being passive consumers, that we end up staring at a screen and not joining in. Passive consumption is the last thing we want when we gather together as a church and when we are scattered in the week. Christian worship that Jesus loves is never designed to be consumeristic. God is the only audience in Christian worship. All of us are participants in Christian worship. True Christian worship is participatory. I'm going to suggest three ways in which you can participate this morning and in this week and in the weeks to come as we gather together. Participate and not be passive consumers. Number one, Use the comment section on the Facebook to engage with the rest of the community. You might want to ask for prayer. You might want to raise questions. You might want to share a good news story. And most importantly, as you see those prayer requests, as you uh, see those good news stories, spend time praying, interceding, and praising God. You see, none of us are passive consumers. We get the invitation to become participants in worship. So the 91 of us who are there this morning participate by engaging in the comment section. There's a second way in which I think I'm going to invite you to participate. I want you to participate this week when we finish our service or sometime during the week to phone someone you know at church and uh, perhaps someone who you haven't seen for a while. You see, um, a couple of weeks ago, um, I sat down with Katie Jenkins, our administrator, Rob Byrne, our operations manager, Amanda and myself, we sat down with um, Denise Young, who's an electoral officer and the church wardens. And we updated and looked at our church list. Um, and uh, we have over 400 people on our record, and not including children and young people who are connected with the life of our church, either attending regularly or semi-regularly, each one is precious to God. But listen carefully, if you just leave it to me and Amanda to connect with the 400 people, we as a church will fail miserably. Imagine the impact on our church community and our, our parish indeed, if each of us take a responsibility to reach out to someone uh, uh, on the phone. So I'm asking you to phone a friend or two this week. Reach out because you care for them. If I and my team in the office can do anything to support you uh, or them, we would love to hear from you. We have time and are willing to come alongside you to support you as you bring people as well. I was so encouraged as I was speaking this week with a number of people. People are phoning and reaching out to each other. So what I'm saying is if all of us do it, we will be reaching our community and imagine the impact of that. Second is phone a friend. The third way in which we can participate is this. Imagine we are in the church building and I think I'm hoping and praying for a day we will come back to the church building. I would be asking you as your vicar to bring your friends, invite your friends. I would be saying to you, if your faith is important to you, share it. It is so easy to invite your friends to church online. Please can I ask you to, if you haven't already done so, to like and to subscribe St. Mark's page so that your friends can benefit from the content we put out pretty much every day. Chris Goddle, Simon Morby and their team do a brilliant job of providing a children's service each Sunday morning at nine o'clock, a service of singing, story and craft. Who knows, someone on your Facebook page 
uh, friends list might need that at this point in time. They're not going to get it unless you share the page. Myla, Graham, Catherine, Emily, and Elizabeth, and their teams work hard to uh, uh, facilitate sung worship for us. Luke Prankard continues to do a brilliant job on the background and Chris Blewett is on it as well. A whole team of people get our reflections each morning and evening going. God alone knows who on your friends list will find Jesus Christ by you sharing. We work hard on the background to make online worship, praise and prayer happen. We want this to be a blessing to as many people as we can. This is arguably the easiest time in modern history to be an evangelist. So don't miss the moment. So I'm asking you what I would love for you to do and for us as a church to do is for us to invite our friends on our Facebook to share by, by sharing and liking and inviting them to subscribe to our page. So there you have it. Three things you can do uh, by, for participating and not just being passive consumers, by engaging, by commenting, by phoning a friend this week and sharing, liking and inviting your friends to subscribe to our Facebook. Katie Bonwell. Mission partners are people we support in three ways. We pray for them. We support them financially. 10% of all the money we receive is allocated to mission, both locally and internationally. In supporting them financially and prayerfully, we let them know that we are for them, that we are behind them in the call that God has placed on their lives to be missionaries. This week, I caught up with Katie Barnwell, who is one of our mission partners at St. Mark's. Since 1971, Katie has served on Bible translation programs in Nigeria. She has trained people in translation programs in Kenya, Cameroon, Mexico, Guatemala, Peru, Papua New Guinea, Philippines, and the Solomon Islands. She has also been involved in the Jesus Film Project to do with the translation of the Jesus Film in several languages. Since 2016, she is based in the UK and she continues to be involved in training translation consultants, specifically in Nigeria. This week I caught up with her and you're very welcome to eavesdrop on our conversation. So, can you tell me why is Bible translation important? Well, because the Lord told his followers to preach the gospel to all nations. And in fact, he said that uh, the, the gospel must be preached to all nations and then the end will come. Mm. We have a, a task to do and language is a barrier. We have to get through the barrier of language. Mm. And uh, we, it's no good trying to share a message if uh, the person we're speaking to doesn't understand the language we say or can't read the book that we give him. Mm. So um, if we want to communicate the gospel, not just the basic gospel, but the whole teaching of Christ hmm. to uh, translate, be involved with translating. It's a, it's a real team partnership. With the, the, those who go to tr help translate and those in the areas hmm. who are involved in doing the translation. Hmm. I can imagine, Katie, um, one of the great privileges of um, having done the translation work for years is the privilege of dwelling in God's word and being spoken to by God on a regular basis through different seasons in our lives. What mm -hmm. is God saying to you at the moment? <laughs> well, um, I think uh, one of the, uh, we go through various crises in our lives. And for me, I guess the present crisis is getting old. Mm feeling the restrictions of uh, physical restrictions mm. and and yet having that sense of i've still got work to do so and i found that right through life whenever there's a crisis the lord does show the way through mm. so the lord is saying to me keep trusting and i will help you i'll give you the strength i'll give you the wisdom you lack and uh, we'll uh, finish the task 
and that is a word we can truly hold on to um, this day. In fact, we at St. Mark's, we are focusing on the person of Jesus, and we are looking at the Old Testament characters uh, who point us to Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it's typically called type, typology. Uh, uh, and um, uh, today we're looking at Adam, you know, uh, the old Adam, and we are going to look at the new Adam, uh, who Jesus is. Um, who, uh, Katie, is Jesus to you? Well, um, the, the, the whole, the word of God is filled with messages about being united with Christ and having Christ dwelling in your heart through his power, through what he's done for us. So it's uh, trying to live day by day in the awareness of the presence of the Lord. Mm. And uh, I think it helps being single. Um, and also, even in this uh, situation of self-isolating at the moment, it gives us more time to mm. really think about the presence of the Lord. Yeah. So I would say uh, Jesus is growing to know Jesus more, trying to allow him to work in my life, to, mm. to really work out um, all that he has to do to make me more able to uh, please him by my, by my life. Yeah. That's wonderful, Katie. Um, one of the things that uh, you refer to just there is about the presence of Jesus. And in fact, last week we talked about that um, because wherever renewal comes, there is a sense of God's presence. And one thing that there is in God's presence, in the presence of Jesus, is joy. What has mm -hmm. been some of the joys that you have experienced this year? Mm -hmm. Well, um one of the, I was I was very disappointed in March when I was planning to go to Nigeria and have some weeks there with the teams, and it became impossible to travel. But out of that situation, new things have happened which we never envisaged. Mm. And talking with the teams face to face over Zoom. <laughs> this morning I had three hours uh, talking with the one of the teams checking their translation, um, mm. interacting, and God is, it's amazing what the technical things that the Lord has opened up to us in these days. Mm. Uh, it's been a joy. Uh, it and really also, is, yes. Just uh, enjoying the beauty of the world and the fact that uh, the Lord didn't just make things utilitarian, but he made them beautiful. And mm -hmm. even from where I am, I can see trees and see birds coming across from time to time, seeing the roses. Um, it just gives many joys, joy of music too, and being able to hear and participate in just worshipping the Lord. That's um, lovely. That's um, lovely. When one day we will worship him with people of all, all nations and all times, uh, worshipping the Lord together. Wonderful. And that's one of the great privileges at St. Mark's. We have the privilege of worshipping from people across the world. Uh, just when you just said about uh, traveling, uh, I'm not sure if you know this, I just came back from a sabbatical, but I've traveled to quite a few countries. I went as far as New Zealand and uh, made my way back um, uh, over the last three mm -hmm. or four months. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that really struck me is... Um, how much the Lord reminded me and spoke to me. Uh, um, some new things and some renewed things uh, as things that I just remembered, uh, the mm -hmm. things the Lord spoke to me uh, years ago. Mm -hmm. What have you learned about God um, over the last three months? Yes, so much. I find even, you know, every day when you read the word, I, I try to find a particular little nugget to keep in mind all the way through the, the day. Yeah. And I think at the moment, especially learning to worship God um, and in prayer, not just to be asking things, but taking time to worship him, mm. thank him, and to listen to him. I would say it's all my, all my life I've always said, Lord, teach me to pray. And I feel that's something I go on learning more about and I still have a lot to learn. So um, that's one of the things the, the Lord is teaching me, 
in these days and will go on teaching me. That is remarkable because um, uh, I'm not sure if you know this. Last year, I went and spent some time with um, uh, John Collins, who used to be the vicar here oh, yes, uh, some I time remember. ago. And John one of the things that he taught me was the significance of prayer. You know, he is in his 90s and uh, his passion burns bright for prayer. And one of the, one of the fires he lit in me is, is a fire for seeking the Lord Jesus Christ in Mm -hmm. prayer. So thank you for reminding uh, me and us today of the, of the mm -hmm. need to pray as a way of stretching yes. ourselves. Um, one of the things we are doing, Katie, as I said, is, um, is inviting people to uh, gaze on Jesus, to seek God's presence. And mm -hmm. when you do spend time with Jesus in the Gospels, you find he is uh, 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 utterly brilliant. He is beautiful. He is rich. Uh, and there is always something new to learn about him, I find. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Is there a particular teaching that the Lord Jesus Christ is resonating and stretching you at this stage in your life right now? Well, um, I guess as what I've already said, just uh, understanding, coming to know Christ more and more. And uh, you mentioned the Gospels and the Old Testament. You know, when we started translation, the focus in, in the world where I was working was very much on the New Testament. But now, um, particularly the groups I'm working with, when they had the New Testament, they're saying, well, no, we want the whole Bible. And it's true that right through the Bible, you see God's plan being worked out. At the moment we're working on 1 Samuel and uh, the wonderful story of how Hannah prayed for, for uh, a son and then gave him to God, and how God worked through him, and how the whole plan of salvation worked through him, and then uh, the choosing of David, and how he was counseled. So yes, this, the, just the greatness of God's plan mm. over, the, over the ages, and what he's still doing, and what he's going to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Katie, that's wonderful. Uh, you know full well, we at St. Mark's, many of us kind of uh, really look forward to receiving your updates and prayers. And you know that we love you very much and we pray for you. And uh, we love it when you do come and visit us. How can we as a church be praying for you in the coming days? Yes, indeed. And I'm very deeply grateful for um, your prayers. And... Uh, Especially, or well, I would just mention the fact that the the training manual that I've been working on, which is mm. now just coming into just, just being published, in, with, we hope within the next few weeks, uh, two or three weeks, and uh, answered that prayer. And now that the, I'm focusing again on work with the, uh, the three Mbembe languages on Old Testament. Mm. Uh, the fact that we can day by day interact, um, it, it just studying the word, um, raising questions, discussing the exegesis, discussing how best to express the ideas in a very different cultural context. Sure. So pray for wisdom. Um, I was going to show you, if I can, a picture of the team. Can I try that? Of course you can, yeah. Um, which is just the, the picture of the team um, and to pray for them, to pray for protection in these days, um, uh, health, good health, because yeah. um, there's a real, uh, they're real, very exposed. And um, especially as they work together, there are two pictures, one with just the whole team and the other is showing how they work together, which involves being close together, looking at computers and so on. So pray for protection. Pray for all the, the gifts of the Spirit that they need to do the work they have to do. Um, and good health and strength. And I would say the same thing for myself. That, um, that I can finish my part of the job well. Um, uh, Katie, that's fantastic. Uh, you are an inspiration to so many of us. Uh, we appreciate you. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you again um, in due course. Thank you so much for making time to speak. Good. About well, this thank you for arranging it and for inviting me. Yeah. God bless you, Katie. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you for the grace you've given unto us, Lord Jesus, to reassure us that you were there if we were able to be at all. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. To break every chain. To break every chain. Hey. There is power in the name of Jesus. Lord Jesus, we break, we break all the chains, Lord Jesus. We cry up unto you, Lord God, to come heal our land. Heal our land, Lord Jesus. Show yourself strong and mighty like.
like never before. Thank you, Jesus, because we know that your blood makes us whole. Amen. Good morning, everyone. God bless you all. Isn't God a great God? We serve a God who is the God of the impossible. He is a totally loving God that wants to commune and dwell and be in us and to set us free. Let's remember that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, so that we can stand in the authority of Jesus to see his kingdom come and to see his will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Let us pray. God, you are a great God. You are the creator of all things. <clears throat> From the knitting together of tiny little babies in the womb to the sun, the moon and the stars. There is none like you. You're an awesome God. You are magnificent and yet so loving. Jesus, what a savior you are. You are the Alpha and Omega. You're ascended to the Father and seated at the right hand as King of Kings and Lord of Lords where you prepare a place for us. Thank you that you came to destroy all the works of the enemy, to make a way to reconcile the world back to God, to bring us new life, abundant life and eternal life, to bring us peace, joy and contentment and to baptize us in the Holy Ghost and with fire. And thank you, Lord, that you are coming again. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being here with us and being in us until Jesus comes again. God, we are so privileged and yet so undeserving. Your grace is amazing and wonderful. And for this, we are so grateful. Lord, thank you that we can approach your throne of grace with our prayers because of what Jesus has done on the cross. So Lord, we pray especially for those that have been recently bereaved. May those that are going through this valley know your comfort and care. May they see your light shining. May they see that you are with them and that you are always there for them. Be with them and strengthen them, we pray. Lord, thank you for your mercy and for your hearing and answering our prayers in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for those that have life-threatening and body-damaging diseases such as cancer, COVID-19, multiple sclerosis. Lord, we pray for a healing touch on their lives. And Lord, we pray for a rapid rehabilitation. Lord, we pray that there shall be no more death at the hand of these diseases. We pray that your resurrection life will flow through their veins to overcome these life-threatening diseases in the name of Jesus. Lord, we stand on your word in the authority of Jesus made possible because of your death on the cross. So we command these life-threatening diseases to leave these bodies now and never return in Jesus' name. Lord, we also pray for the families of those that are suffering. Be with them too. Continue to strengthen them. Lord, thank you for your mercy and for hearing and answering our prayers in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for those workers that continue to tend to the needs of others, particularly those that have been tending to those suffering from COVID-19. Lord, we pray your protection upon them. Lord, we pray for a wall of fire protection upon them. Lord, thank you for your mercy and for hearing and answering our prayers in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for those of our friends and relatives that do not know you, that do not have Jesus as their personal saviour. Dear God, Dear Holy Spirit, we pray that you would draw them to Jesus. Lord, we pray for our young people and children, Lord, at this time, as they're kept from friends. Help them with their schooling and their studies. Help them not to fear what is going on in the world, but to turn their eyes towards you. Lord, we also pray for those children in the world, Lord, that uh, are suffering child abuse, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you shall Stop the abusers right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we also pray that those that are considering abortion shall not abort their children, Lord. They shall want their children. And where there's diseases and problems, Lord, that your healing touch shall come in Jesus' name. 
Lord, we pray for the families, especially those at this time that are suffering from domestic abuse. Lord, again, we pray that you shall stop the domestic abuse and the violence. Lord, we pray for those that are gripped by alcohol, drugs, gambling, and internet sites. Lord, we pray that you shall do something new, Lord, in their lives. Set them free from these bondages, these things that want to destroy them. Lord, we lift up to you our mission partners for Katie Barnwell and her team. We pray, Lord, that you shall help them well together, work well together. And we pray for their health and Katie Barnwell's health, Lord. We pray for those at the El Campello Christian Community Church in Spain and for Margaret Weston. We pray for Francis and Diane in France, Lord. We also lift up to you those in Sao Paulo where COVID-19 is rampant. Lord, we pray that you shall stop COVID-19 and that the health services there shall be able to cope, Lord, and help shall come. But help from you, Lord, as well as those in other cities in Brazil. Lord, we pray for our government, Lord, that they shall have wisdom and that they shall do your will and that they shall turn to Jesus and seek him and seek God. We also pray for our church leaders at St. Mark's, St. Mary's in the Reach. Be with them all, we pray. Continue to lead and guide them. We thank you for them all. We thank you for the staff that support them so well. Bless them all, we pray in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you for your mercy and for hearing and answering our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Good morning, St. Mark's. The reading today is taken from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 15, the fall. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, You may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, she also did, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realised they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning and welcome as we start looking at the first character in our series of True and Better. And it was so good, wasn't it? And Katie saying, you know, that we have this, this story that is revealed through the whole of the Old Testament. And we're gonna begin at the very beginning today. So it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. 
It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. So begins Charles Dickens's book, A Tale of Two Cities. And this morning, we are not going to be looking at two cities, but the tale of two gardens. But the sentiments that are expressed in those famous opening lines can be equally applied to our tale this morning. For in one garden, what should have been the best of times becomes the worst of times. And the foolishness of man launched an epoch of incredulity or a period of disbelief, which led to a season of darkness and a winter of despair. And then in the other garden, wisdom prevails to launch a season of light where an epoch of belief launches the spring of hope. Our tale begins in the Garden of Eden. God's perfect kingdom on earth with the creation of humanity, of Adam and Eve. Genesis 1 tells us, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over the, all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And in chapter two, we are told how God makes mankind and that he puts mankind in the Garden of Eden. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. And later on it says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. I think it's important to just add a footnote here if you like, that man at this point is still a single entity, male and female wrapped up in one and reflecting God. Uh, and it's later in the chapter, um, after no suitable helper is found for mankind, that God divides mankind into male and female. And so when we talk about Adam and Jesus being a true and better Adam, I'm not just talking about Adam as a man, but rather Adam as the representation of all of us, the whole of mankind. And so by the end of the chapter, we have both Adam and Eve, bear image bearers of God, reflecting the glory of God, living in a perfect garden full of abundance, with every conceivable plant to eat, easy gardening, no weeds, no thorns, and their purpose to represent God, to take charge of creation and to work the ground and extend that kingdom, extending the Garden of Eden to cover the whole of creation, the whole earth. And then it all goes horribly wrong. In our reading, we heard what I suspect is a very familiar tale, even if we don't know the actual story of Adam and Eve and their fall from grace, we can recognise their thought patterns and their behaviours in how we live our lives today and the problematic outcomes that result from them. Satan, in the form of a serpent, questions what God has says. He starts to twist the offer um, of abundance into a restriction. God has essentially said you can eat from all of the trees except this one. Satan starts with, did God say you couldn't eat from any tree? Eve responds with um, what God has said, but then she adds a bit to it. She increases the restriction. As well as not eating from the tree, they now cannot touch the tree. Satan then implies that God is holding out on them, that he knows that they will be like God if they eat from the fr this fruit, that he's lied, that they won't die. 
Essentially, Satan is trying to convince Adam and Eve that God is not to be trusted. And the fruit looks good. And so she eats. And so does Adam, who incidentally is not innocent in this. He's standing next to Eve through the whole exchange. He could have said no. He could have corrected Eve in what she'd said. He could have encouraged her to come away. But no, he too is complicit in this act of disobedience to God. And in that moment of disobedience, sin enters into creation. Sin that distorts our vision of ourselves as we were created to be. Distorts the perfection that God had created. It's a bit like when you go into a fairground and you go into the house of mirrors um, and you look all wobbly and tall and skinny and, and tiny. Or even when we go shopping, you know, because even in clothes shops, when you try on clothes, the mirrors are ever so slightly angled to make us look fractionally taller and fractionally slimmer and fractionally better in the clothes that we are trying on. And that's probably closer to what Satan achieves for most of us, because when a sinful nature is reflected back like it is in the House of Mirrors, it's really easy to see that we are distorted. But in those changing rooms, it's not that easy because it's just a fraction, just a tiny bit different to what we really are. Sin distorts our image. We no longer resemble the person that we were created to be. And the reading goes on. At once their eyes were opened and they realized that they were naked. They moved, as it were, from a position of innocence to one in which they could see their own inherent sinfulness. And they tried to cover up with leaves, to hide behind the tree when they hear God coming. And this act of disobedience is one I think we can all empathize with. This lack of trust, this fear that God or somebody else, for that matter, is holding out on us. Wanting to be in control of our own lives, a desire to be in charge to do it ourselves. I know that if somebody tells me I can't do it something, I immediately want to go and do it. It's my nature and it's quite often sinful and rebellious. And then in the exchange that follows between God and Adam and Eve, we see the second part of our sinful nature kicking in. It wasn't me, says Adam, it was her. And if that wasn't enough, he even tries to shift the blame to God. He says, the woman that you put here with me. It was her fault. And Eve's having none of it either. Not me, she says. The servant deceived me. It's his fault. And we do this, don't we? When we mess up. We instinctively try to shift the blame, to deflect from ourselves, to make it someone else's fault. We might not want to admit it, but I think that we all do it. We all try to justify our actions rather than take responsibility for ourselves. When I was a teacher and you'd, you'd find students who were fighting or doing other stuff that they um, weren't supposed to be doing, and their first reaction was always, but he did this or she did that. The exchange would usually go something like, uh, Joe, why are you fighting? And Joe would say, well, Peter did this. OK, so what did you do? And Joe would say, well, I didn't do anything. And he said, but you were fighting. Well, yes, but, but it was his fault because he did this. I guess you probably recognise that conversation in some form or context. And if we go back to the garden, it was Satan's fault. But Adam and Eve and the student in my conversation and we are complicit in what happens. They had a choice. We have a choice in how we respond. Obedience and trust that God is good, that he has our best interests at heart, that what he says is true or disobedience and distrust, thinking that we know better. 
Adam and Eve could have said no. We are already like God. We are created in his image. We reflect him. We're already in charge. God created us. We trust him. But they didn't. And so often, neither do we. Adam is our forefather. We all share in his nature. We are inclined to sin, to idolatry, to put ourselves before God, before anyone else. In fact, Romans 5.19 says that by one man's disobedience, that Adam's, the many, which is us, were made sinners. And if we're honest with ourselves, we know it. Even the best of us deep down know the truth of 1 John 1.8, which says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Or Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The glory, remember, that we were created to reflect. And remember, sin is putting ourselves first before God or before anyone else, thinking and acting as if our needs are more important than anyone else's. We can trace all bad, wrong, negative, hurtful behaviour from theft, murder, adultery, poverty, injustice, etc. Back to this attitude that I and my needs and wants are more important than anyone else's. And if you don't believe me, just let me give you a really silly and simple example of how inescapable this really is. Somebody tags you in a picture on Facebook or some other social media. What's your first reaction? Think about it. We go straight to the picture, don't we? Do I look good? Have they got my best side? Do I look fat? Do I look stupid? Is it less than flattering? And if it is, do we untag ourselves? Back to original sin, to Adam. The consequence of disobedience are immediate. Death enters creation for the first time. Not the immediate death of Adam, but the death of an animal, sacrificed so that God can provide garments to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness. And Adam is banished from the Garden of Eden, out from God's kingdom on earth and into the wilderness, a place that is now cursed, that is hard work and full of pain. And death, whilst not immediate, is inevitable. And the way back to the kingdom of God, the Garden of Eden, is barred because in the garden is also the tree of life. Now, before Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge, death was not part of the plan. So presumably eating from the tree of life was not an issue. They had not been forbidden from eating from it. It only becomes such after they are disobedient, after death becomes part of creation. But there is good news and redemption, even here in this first act of disobedience, because we're told God comes looking for Adam and Eve. He knows what they've done, yet he wants to find them, to help them, to cover them. Even as they suffer the consequence of their disobedience, God is working for their good. And already in this narrative is hidden God's plan for redemption and restoration. In verse 15, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now, I really identify with that passage. I'm a woman and I really do not like snakes or worms or anything that slithers without legs. It just makes me shudder. But this really isn't about a woman not liking snakes. It's a reference to Jesus, fully human, born of a woman, but also God, born of the spirit, whom the devil will strike, but who will ultimately crush Satan and overcome death. And we find several references in the New Testament to Jesus being the second Adam. 
1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 47 says, so it is written, the first man, Adam, become, became a living, a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. And Romans 5 describes Adam as the pattern of the one to come while talking about Jesus, but contrasts the first Adam, who because of his disobedience caused sin to enter the world and thus death for us all, with the obedience of Jesus, which brings grace and righteousness and eternal life for those who trust in him. Which brings us to our second garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. Where Jesus prays to God, knowing that he is called to go to the cross, pleading with God to take the cup from him, yet remaining obedient to God and remaining in the garden, allowing the events that follow to take their course. I don't know how many of you have seen The Passion of Christ. But one of the scenes that sticks in my mind is that of Jesus in Gethsemane as he prays and the snake slithers around the ground around him. And then there's an eerie figure of Satan hovering in the background and you can feel the tension and realise the determination that it took to stay, to be obedient, to see God's plan through to the end. And how Satan thinks he's victorious as Jesus remains and is arrested and moves towards the crucifixion. But that's not the only comparison that we can make between Adam, the first man, and Jesus, this true and better Adam. Adam is expelled from the garden, the place that represents the kingdom of God on this earth. And he is sent into the wilderness beyond to live and toil in a place of darkness and despair and difficulty and disbelief. And Jesus, like the first Adam, resides in the kingdom of God, resides in God's kingdom in heaven. But he chooses to leave and to enter the world, the wilderness that Adam had been sent into. And whilst Adam gives into temptation in Eden, in God's kingdom, Jesus, just after he has been baptised and received the spirit of God, goes into the wilderness on earth and there he overcomes temptation. We're told in the Gospels that the devil tempts Jesus three times. But unlike Adam, he refuses to distrust God refuses to make himself the centre of the picture, refuses to put his needs first and constantly points to God as the most important and perfectly able. Jesus is God coming to us, seeking us out, providing a covering for our nakedness, our sin. And he comes as a man, but a perfect one, one who does not give in to temptation, who refuses to sin, refuses to put himself at the centre of everything in order that he to restore creation to God's original plan and purpose, to enable man to be reborn, remade into a new creation, a different kind of Adam, one born not of flesh, but of the spirit. One who has the potential to choose to overcome sin, to make right choices, to trust God, to live life the way God intended on this earth and then to live eternally with God in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus enables us to return to the Garden of Eden, the kingdom of God. He enables us to eat from the tree of eternal life both as we live to restore God's kingdom on this earth and though we still die on this earth, to live eternally in heaven. One person um, that I was reading puts it like this, that Jesus 
injects us with an anti-venom that counteracts, counteracts the effects of sin in our lives, to restore in us the image of God. And the more we look to him, the more we reflect that image in ourselves. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about Jesus being the second Adam, but also about him being the first fruit. Jesus overcomes death as he is raised to new life. He becomes the first of a new race of Adam. And that if we choose to follow him, to surrender our lives to him, to give up our old lives and our old nature, that of the first Adam, we are able to be born again, born of water and the spirit of God. Next week, we're going to celebrate Pentecost when the spirit was poured out on all those who believed in Jesus, the spirit that continues to be poured out into those who choose to follow him, the anti-venom, if you like, that helps us to negate sin, to, to, to work against sin. And Pentecost is, in fact, the Jewish festival of first fruits, when the Jewish people would celebrate the harvest of the first of a new crop that would sustain them and would enable them to live. And so we celebrate Jesus as that first fruit, the new, the true, the better Adam, who restores our broken relationship with God and with creation, through whom we are able to overcome death and live lives of fullness on this earth and eternally in heaven. And so for those of you watching who maybe have never thought about this before, who have never done this, I wanna invite you now to surrender your life to Jesus, to acknowledge that you have a fallen nature as a first Adam to say sorry for all the wrongs in your life and to invite Jesus to pour his Holy Spirit upon you, to ask him to accept you into his family, a truer and a better second race of Adam. I'm gonna pray a prayer now and to do this. And if you want to, you can join me by repeating the prayer as I say it, and I'll leave a space after each line. And you can do that wherever you are right now. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, I come to you now and I offer my life to you. I realize that I am a sinner. I am sorry for everything that I have done wrong. The stuff that I have done willingly and the stuff I don't even realize that I have done. Today, I repent of those sins. And I ask you for forgiveness. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. So that I can know the right things to do. And so I can reflect you better. Becoming the person you originally intended me to be. Amen. And so if you prayed that prayer, please let us know. Please get in touch by email or call us. And the contact details will be in the comments um, on the Facebook page or on our website. Or you can send us a personal message through Messenger and let us know. 
and we can send you some resources that will help you to follow Jesus. We can put you in touch with others near you that can help too, even in these times. I'm going to hand back to Mayowa now for some more worship. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being the light in the darkness. Thank you for being the peace in the storm. Thank you for being the true and better Jesus. Because you are all in all. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Good morning, St. Mark's. Thank you for joining us today. On Monday, we received some difficult news. A former member of our congregation, Liz Willock, formerly Liz Croft, passed away in hospital last Saturday. Liz, as many of you will remember, was a member of our congregation for many years and she was heavily involved in St. Mark's playgroup before it became the preschool. 
We as a church would like to extend our deepest sympathies and our prayers to all of Liz's family, including her daughter, Jessica, at this most difficult time. Now, we've heard that many, well, we've heard that a few of the congregation uh, are finding it difficult to access these services online. That could be because they don't have a computer or because they have a bad internet connection. If you know of anybody who is in this position, please let us at the office know, and we would be more than happy to arrange to burn a um, copy of the service onto a DVD and have that posted to them. Uh, so if you know anyone who is struggling to watch these services online each week, then just let us know and we can get a DVD out to them. In regards to our following online, I'm delighted to say that our following has almost quadrupled from since it was from the beginning of last year. This is wonderful. We are seeing absolutely brilliant engagement and we are seeing people engage with our Lord, our Father online here at St Mark's. Um, in the same way that you might invite a friend to church with you in more normal times, consider inviting friends to watch one of the services or one of our weekly, well, our daily reflections with, with you online. Um, you can do this by just asking them to join at 10.30 in the morning on a Sunday or at 9am or 8pm on other days for our reflections and Compline. Or you could just invite them to like or follow our page. Just go to community. Um, it's on the right hand side of our Facebook page and just click invite friends or um, or you can just tell them through um, when you speak to them. But yeah, um, be, be sure to invite friends along to this because it's a great way to spread the gospel and it's what we're online for. Um, in other news, uh, as usual, we are working from home still. Uh, the number is the same to get us on 01634 570489 or email Katie Jenkins at admin at org or myself at ops manager St Mark's Gilling at St Mark's Gillingham.org. Uh, we can pick up your voicemails remotely, so just leave a name and number and we will get back to you. Um, continue to support Food Bank Friends, whether that's through the Sparable app, which you can download on the App Store or on Google Play, or whether that's going to medway.foodbank.org.uk and making a monetary donation there. Um, also, um, if you feel called to, then um, there is an option to support your local parish church as well on our website. Just go about halfway down or about two thirds down on the home page and click giving um, or give online. And there's a simple form for you to fill out. Please don't feel obligated to give. This is um, just something if you wish to support your local parish church, the option is there. Thank you. Have a wonderful week and God bless you all. Isolation, quarantine, social distancing are words void of fellowship. Gospel Night, in conjunction with North Gillingham Churches, presents Praise United, an evening of fellowship, spontaneous gospel music, and unhindered worship on the 31st of May, Sunday evening at 6.30 p.m. Streamed live on Facebook, featuring Mark Handerton, solo sax and a word of exhortation from Pastor Chris. Join us with a heart of worship and your praise for it as we render praises to God.
Thank you, Maiwa and team, and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you particularly to those who engaged uh, in the comment section as I cast my eye. There's plenty of prayer requests there, uh, plenty for us to be interceding and praying for, and therefore we as a church will pray for those things. Great to see Katie Barnwell as well. I loved it that you joined us as well, although we recorded our recording last week. Uh, I'm so glad you were able to join us. So Katie, thank you for blessing us in that. I uh, also loved it that uh, um, Imran Shergill, all the way from Pakistan, has joined us as well. Um, those of you who don't know, um, Imran is um, a Raymond's dad and he has joined us from Pakistan. So it's wonderful. One of those things um, we're finding actually people from around the world are joining us for worship, which is such a wonderful privilege. Don't forget to phone a friend or two this week. It takes the whole church to reach the whole parish, not just uh, leaving it to the vicar and the staff. Thank you for the 16 or 17 people, including Valerie Flick and Karen Turnbull, Rob Byrne and Mayo and others who have shared our service with the friends today. Thank you so much. For the rest of you, don't forget to share, subscribe and invite your friends to St. Mark's page. Who knows? Who knows who on your list might find Jesus Christ uh, through this season. We are here right through the week uh, in the mornings and reflections at nine o'clock, in the evenings at eight o'clock, in the evening for our evening prayer. Um, we're back for our children's worship at nine o'clock next Sunday and of course our morning worship as we uh, celebrate the person of the Holy Spirit at 10 30 next Sunday. Meanwhile, we'd love to hear from you. I would love particularly to hear from those who've joined us for the first time today. And perhaps if you've accepted the message that uh, Amanda brought to us uh, for the first time, we would love to hear from you. We would love to help you further on your spiritual journey. So drop us an email or uh, personal message us on Facebook. A final blessing. Father, you know where we are today. And you know the future. You know what is going to happen this week. So we seek your blessing on our lives. So church, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. And may he give you his peace. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.